Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Today, I'll be giving an introduction into some of the optimization steps, guidelines, and tips needed to develop a reliable and robust multiplex panel using Opal technology. I'll also briefly touch on the automation capabilities with our Leica Bond RX Auto Stainer. The following slide shows an overview of the steps involved in the design, optimization, and validation of an Opal multiplex panel. The first step when developing a new panel is to validate each of your primary antibodies first chromogenically and then fluorescently. The next step is to, is to define the proper staining parameters for each of the individual antibodies and opal pairings known as monoplex slides. This is usually the most challenging and time consuming part in the multiple, multiplex process. You'll also need to generate library slides, each stained with only a single opal fluorophore and no DAPI, a DAPI stain slide and also an autofluorescence slide. These slides will be used to create a spectral unmixing library in InForm. And the last step is the optimization of your multiplex slide. Here is where we assess for crosstalk and interference and rebalance and reorder if needed. So the first step is to optimize all of your primary antibodies. Once the primary antibodies have been sourced for all of the targets of interest, you will need to run a DAB titration for each of your antibodies on a reliable positive control tissue. We recommend running a slide at the vendor's recommended dilution and also at two times and four times dilution. Also, you want to optimize your panel such that it can easily be transferred over to the automated platform stainer. And you have two options for antigen retrieval known as ER1 and ER2. ER1 is a citrate-based pH 6 buffer, whilst ER2 is an EDTA-based and um, pH 9, and this is a more aggressive and stringent antigen retrieval. So the aim here is to generate balanced signal for each marker in the panel, whilst keeping a good staining pattern and signal to background ratio. CALM can provide an antibody optimization um, as a service. Typically, we ask investigators to purchase their antibodies or we can help them select the most appropriate clones. Currently, we have an inventory of approximately 134 antibodies which we have optimized for DAB and then a smaller proportion of these that have been also optimized for use in OPA panels. It is very important to include appropriate positive and negative controls to accurately validate the sensitivity, specificity and reproducibility of your IHC protocol for a given antibody. These include running reagent controls such as a secondary only control which is required to ensure that there is no non-specific binding. An isotype control is also required. This antibody lacks the specificity to the target but matches the class, type and species of the primary antibody and helps determine the contribution of non-specific background staining. Positive and negative control tissues are also recommended and try to stick to controls that express endogenous levels of the target instead of overexpression models. It is important to note that different clones of the same um, antibody can produce very different staining patterns. Here we have human tonsil tissue stained with optimized dilution of four different PDL1 antibody clones. And as you can see here, in the image on the bottom right, the most intense staining of epithelial crypt cells was seen with clone D, followed by clone C. There was no staining with clone A and intermediate staining with clone B. The next step is to create a full titration curve of the primary antibody on monoplex samples and identify the concentration range that shows expected staining pattern. In the example below, the optimized dilution for PDL1 antibody using DAB was 1 in 100, so we then did an opal titration comprising 1 in 100, 1 in 200, and 1 in 400. And as you can see, the optimal staining with the best signal to background ratio was seen with the 1 in 400 dilution, as shown in the image on the bottom right. It is also important to confirm that the conventional DAB IHC looks essentially the same as the simulated IHC or pathology view in InForm. If they look the same, you can then proceed to the next step of adjusting opal detection to achieve signals within the target range. The next step is your monoplex slide optimization. Monoplex slides should be developed with the appropriate number of antigen retrieval steps to assess the robustness of your antigen, antigen retrieval, and also the intensity of your opal fluorophores. The goal here is to achieve a balanced signal for each marker so that the exposure time for each dye falls between 50 to 200 milliseconds or 10 to 30 normalized counts in inform. Monoplex optimizations can be performed on positive control tissue. However, following optimization, the protocols should be implemented 
onto representative study samples. This is necessary as expression levels may vary in these samples. If the signals are lower on study samples compared to positive control tissues, we recommend increasing the primary antibody concentration or changing the opal dilution to increase signal. If you're running your slides manually, we recommend using the opal fluorophore at 1 in 100 and at 1 in 150 if using the Bondarex stainer. The next step is to re the next step to the next step is to determine the order in which your iterative assay will be run. You need to consider both biology of the marker and epitope sensitivity. Some epitopes become more exposed after successive rounds of antigen retrieval and result in greater signal when placed later in the multiplex protocol. And reversely, some rare epitopes may be degraded by multiple exposures to heat and therefore should be placed early in the staining order. Targets such as CD68 and FOXP3, which require citrate-based retrieval, should be placed in early positions or else the signal may diminish, whereas targets which require more aggressive antigen retrievals should be placed later. Another important consideration is masking of antigens due to steric hindrance for markers that are expressed on the same cell, such as CD3 and CD8. Try to have these markers separated in the staining order. If you don't have any information available, then you may choose to take an exhaustive approach and test each target in each position. So each of the 36 positions depicted in the diagram below. However, depending on the depth of experience with each target and antibody, it may be possible to eliminate the possibility of testing perhaps the two most delicate antigens in anything other than positions one and two. The next step is to assign opal fluorophores to each of your markers. When building a novel panel, the simple approach is that each target is tested with each floor. Low express targets should be assigned to brighter fluorophores such as 570 and 620, while more abundant markers should be allotted to dimmer fluorophores such as opal 690. Also for co-expressed markers such as PD-1 and CD-8, it is important to use spectrally separated floors such as 520 and 690. It is not, it, it is not it is not necessary to test all 36 antibody floor combinations as there will be more than one acceptable arrangement. In practice, however, exercise restraint in this step. Test two or three floors for each antibody with the goal of identifying three or four acceptable antibody floor pairings. When assessing the intensity and specificity of your opal monoplex slides, use the information cursor in INFORM shown in the images here. Move to an obviously positive cell and note the signal. In optimised assays, signal intensity on appropriate positive control tissue should fall in the range of four, uh, 5 to 20 counts for all targets. Then move the mouse cursor to an area of non-specific staining and note the signal. The signal, back, the signal to background ratio should be at least 10 to 1. If signal intensity is too high, we recommend firstly decreasing the antibody concentration or pairing it with the weaker fluorophore. If this isn't sufficient, you may want to decrease the concentration of the opal fluorophore. Conversely, a weak target signal can be improved by increasing the concentration of the primary antibody or pairing it with a stronger floor, or alternatively moving the target to the end of the staining sequence as some epitopes become more accessible after extra cycles of antigen retrieval. The next step is to prepare your single, single stain control library slides. These will be used to build your spectral library in INFORM and are necessary to accurately, to, for accurate spectral unmixing and analysis of your monoplex and multiplex slides. So you'll need a total of eight slides for this step. One slide stained with each of your opal fluorophores alone without spectral DAPI. Here you will need to use an antibody marking an ab abundant epitope such as CD20. The emission spectra collected from these slides are less subject to issues related to sparse and, and, or, and or low signal levels. You'll also need one control slide which is stained with DAPI only. And lastly, you'll need one unstained control tissue slide for the assessment of autofluorescence. The unstained slide should be processed in the same way as the other slides, permitting both opal floor and DAPI. Autofluorescence removal um, enables detection of low abundance epitopes by increasing the signal to background ratio. When creating your library slides, we also recommend using tissue from your study. However, a reliable positive control tissue such as tonsil may also be used. 
However, given that autofluorescence varies greatly between different tissue types, in order to get really robust removal, you must use the same tissue type you're studying at least for your autofluorescence slide. Lastly, we recommend building a new library for each study. And note that library slides can be reused for several months when stored under optimal conditions. Once your monoplex slides have been optimized and validated on your representative study samples, it is time to transition them into a full multiplex run. The multiplex workflow is a combination of all the monoplex protocols, keeping DAPI application until the end. So after performing your multiplex staining, either manually or on the bond order stainer, you need to image your slides on the Vectra and spectrally unmix in inform using your prepared library. Next, you need to assess for signal balance, interference and crosstalk and rebalance and reorder if necessary. These assessments are made in inform using the view editor. When transitioning from a monoplex to monoplex fluorescence, signals can increase or decrease individually and become unbalanced. Ideally, you want signal levels to be within a factor of three of each other, especially for spectrally adjacent fluorophores. You also need to assess for signal interference, and this is when one opal dye blocks another, and for that reason, signal levels should usually remain or should be kept below 20 intensity counts, as shown in the image here on the right. And lastly, crosstalk can come from inadequate stripping of antibodies during antigen retrieval with signal of one dye seen in a non-associated channel. This problem is extremely rare and may be related to unusually high affinity primary antibodies. So the ultimate goal here is to achieve a balanced signal for each marker so that exposure times for each dye fall between 50 to 200 milliseconds. Now I'd like to just show you some sevenplex opal panels which we have developed here in CALM for external researchers. This is an opal panel we developed for a client in Adelaide who was interested in identifying and quantifying immune cell populations involved in chronic rhinosinusitis. So we have B lymphocytes identified using a CD20 antibody as, and shown in green, CD68 which is used to identify tissue macrophages, CD138 for plasma cells, CD3 for T lymphocytes, CD11 C dendritic cells, and NBP, which was used to identify eosinophils. Here we stained bone marrow to find samples for a client who wanted to identify immune populations in human leukemia. The panel comprised um, six antibodies, including CD138, IDO, CD68, FOXP3, PDL1, and arginase. And lastly, I'd like to touch on automation of opal multiplex IHC assays with our Lycabond RX. And just note that the basic premise of the opal multiplex assay does not change when performing it on an automated platform. It is still necessary to perform all of the appropriate assay development steps, including antibody optimization, monoplex development, etc. The only difference between running the opal multiplex assay manually versus on an automated platform is the method you use to strip previously bound antibodies from the tissue. The Leica Bond RX is a high throughput and fully automated platform for running opal slides. It allows three days of manual staining on the bench to be reduced to a 12 hour overnight run. The machine has fully automated capabilities including slide preparation, bacon de-wax, antigen retrieval and all the steps involved in a full multiplex panel. The user simply needs to prepare and load the reagents and slides onto the machine as well as set up a protocol via an easy to use software interface. Staining results obtained on the bond are highly reproducible with intra-assay and inter-assay variability being less than 15%. The bond is also highly flexible and can support a myriad of applications including regular IHC, RNA scope and also emerging, emerging technologies such as geomics digital spatial profiling. In CALM we offer training for users to run their staining independently and we also offer a service for users to get their slides stained by CALM staff. Some of the advantages of the bond system is that you can run mod multiple protocols per run as um, as it contains three separate slide staining assemblies, as shown here on the image on the right. So you can simultaneously run, say, 10 slides, 10 sevenplex slides on one SSA, your library slides on another SSA, and monoplex slides on the third. The Bond RX has a universal cover tile system which facilitates gentle, even reagent flow onto the tissue and also prevents evaporation of reagents. 
Furthermore, the large usable area on the slide enables you to place multiple samples on the slide, which provides cost benefits. However, one of the disadvantages of the system is that it has a higher reagent volume compared to manual staining on the, on the bench. It has a dispense volume of 150 microliters and also a 300 microliter dead volume. So just to summarize briefly what we talked about today, the first step when developing an opal multiplex assay is to titrate your antibodies using DAB and then opal fluorescence. Next, you need to perform your monoplex optimizations, and here you should mimic the position in your multiplex IHC where possible. We discussed the importance of staining order and also opal antibody fluorophore pairings to avoid issues such as bleed through and TSA blocking. The third step is to prepare your single stain control library slides, which are used to spectrally unmix and isolate the spectra for each of the opal fluorophores so that you can quantitatively evaluate the locations and co-localizations of your various biomarkers. I also discussed the importance of the autofluorescence slides being run on your study tissue samples to increase your signal to background ratio. And finally is your multiplex optimizations. Here we assess for signal balance, interference and crosstalk and reorder and re rebalance if necessary to achieve a balanced signal for each of your markers. Thank you for listening and happy multiplexing.